Good afternoon. So as you said, uh, my name is Jamie Withhorn. I am a research assistant at the James Martin Center for Nonproliferation Studies. So I do a lot of research and data analysis, kind of all focused towards nuclear nonproliferation. Um, so I spend like most of my days thinking about nuclear weapons. Um, makes me super fun at parties. Um, but what I want to do today a little bit is kind of talk about the underlying thoughts of nuclear weapons and nuclear weapon strategy and kind of how people can begin to reconceptualize those and deconstruct kind of the, the more ancient Cold War kind of thought processes. Um, so specifically, what I'm going to speak about is um, nuclear deterrence. Um, so I'm going to kind of define that a little bit for you and kind of explain some of these intricacies. And then I'm going to kind of um, present some questions and critiques for you to think about a little bit. Um, so kind of what is deterrence? Um, specifically, Thomas Schelling in his book, Arms and Influence, created this concept or kind of coined this conference, um, concept rather. He um, published this in, uh, in the 60s, so kind of right around the height of the Cold War, and he's just kind of presented ways in which we can think about nuclear weapons and theories. And so what he says in this book is very basically, um, the power to hurt is bargaining power. So you have two factors there. You have the power to hurt, and then you have the power to bargain. And so as he kind of goes forward throughout the book, he talks about um, deterrence specifically, and he defines it as kind of using force or the threat of force in order to kind of make your adversary or the other side not do something. So you want them to not do anything, you for, like threaten them to not do that, right? Um, on the other hand there, you have what he coins as compellence. So this is kind of compelling them to do something, to take an action. So again, you're using this, this threat of force in order to get them to do an action. And so kind of what this means is Thomas Schelling, he kind of envisions defense or kind of like war and actual conflict as going in and taking something yourself by utilizing your own resources and your own kind of energy. But if you're using deterrence or compellence, what he calls coercion, um, you're kind of using that force to get them to give you it, right? So you don't, like, it's less difficult in, in theory. Um, I'm going to speak mainly about deterrence just because I think it's kind of more convoluted and there's more room to kind of poke at it a little bit. <clears throat> and so in deterrence, um, Schelling says that there's three main components, right? There's capabilities, communication, and then credibility. Um, first is capabilities. You have to be able to do what you're saying you're going to do, right? So if you say, if you cross X border, I'm going to send three nukes into your territory, you have to have three nukes. So it's kind of the most simple one. You have to be able to do what you're threatening to do. Um, communication is important because the other side needs to know what they can't do, right? They need to know what the line looks like that you can't cross, or they can't cross, rather. What action is it that, that you don't want them to do? So you have to be able to kind of communicate that effectively to the other side. Um, and then lastly, we have credibility. I'm going to kind of come back to this a little bit later because it's probably like the most like um, contested aspect of deterrence. But very basically what it means is what you're saying you're going to threaten them to do, you have to, they have to believe it a credible threat. They have to believe that you're actually going to do that. Um, how do you measure that? How do you know? We'll kind of get into that a little, a little bit later when we kind of do the uh, more critiques of things. Um, two other kind of points I want to make about the technicalities of deterrence are, um, the first is that more nuclear weapons doesn't mean more nuclear deterrence, right? So if you go back to the three com components, capabilities is only one part, but there's a whole bunch of factors kind of affecting this theoretical strategic kind of framework of deterrence. So if you have more nukes, it's not going to mean more deterrence. Um, and then lastly, I'd just like to point out um, the concept of mutually assured destruction. So again, in Arms and Influence, he's writing around Cold War time, Cuban Missile Crisis had just happened, and there was like this, this idea floating around about mutually assured destruction. Um, but it's important to note that mutually assured destruction isn't a policy or a tactic, it's a situation that kind of occurs after you implement deterrence or after you have this whole arms build up. So you're not effectively kind of saying, if you do this, we're gonna have mutually assured destruction. It's not that, rather it's kind of the end product of saying, if you do X, um, we'll do Y, right? So again, not a policy, kind of a situation. Um, so why does that all matter, I guess? I think that 
it's important to note that this, is, these, this foundational theory is how we have shaped American U.S. nuclear policy since the Cold War. This theory that our nukes are protecting us, they're doing good, it's been like the, the foundation for all of our strategy, all of our strategic thinking, all of our decision kind of making processes. But the thing is, deterrence is a theory. It's an abstract conception. It's a theory. It's not a law. It's not a policy. It's not something you can like attain really. Um, like physically. So you don't really ever know deterrence is working, right? Because if you say, you can't do X or I'll do Y, and the other side doesn't do X, you don't know if it's because you threatened them or if it's because it wasn't in their best interest to do it, right? So you're not, unless you are on the other side and in their like, shoes, you don't really know that your threatening like power is actually working. Um, two other points I kind of like to make out is deterrence like in today's society and like today's generation also doesn't really make sense because um, there are two points Shelley makes out um, about how sometimes it's beneficial if uh, leaders are irrational and a little hot-headed, but Shelley <laughs> didn't have to deal with Trump, right? So he didn't have to kind of see like this president tweeting at 4 a.m. some like crazy things, right? And so he doesn't, he says that that would yield more deterrence, but arguably I don't see that happening, right? I don't feel more secure, I don't feel more safe with our nuclear weapons when our president is tweeting at 4 a.m. about some crazy shit. So I think that it's really important to kind of understand that as dynamics change and kind of as things change, this irrationality doesn't really yield more security, right? And it's not going to kind of happen unless like, that may have been the theory in the Cold War, again, with like situations of mutually assured destruction, but times have changed, so why hasn't the theory also changed? Um, another point I'd like to point out is that deterrence is like an ongoing thing. You never really know um, when it ends, right? So we live again in a time of endless wars, endless conflict, and to add to that, deterrence is going to have to continue um, to continue unless one side takes an action towards like a nuclear escalation type thing. So you're going to have this always like this constant threat of having a nuclear exchange, which is like kind of mirrors this constant conflict. And I would argue that that's not peace, that's not stability, that's not strategy. You're kind of just always having this like looming threat of nuclear war. So um, those are kind of just some basic critiques. I um, want to include some more. I have some memes, because why not? Um, so these are memes made by my close friend, uh, Martin Pfeiffer. Marty is doing his PhD in nuclear anthropology at the University of New Mexico. And so with these memes, I think it's kind of fun because in a way it's like communicating the invalidity of deterrence to boomers using memes. Um, but what I like personally is the bottom meme there where it kind of talks about real world escalation dynamics. So the axe itself is the real world escalation dynamics and the, the wood door is deterrence theory, right? So in deterrence theory you're like, oh, conflict will escalate in this set way. But when it happens, conflict is kind of its a beast of its own nature. It's going to do what it does, and there's no way you can kind of control that or set it on a set trajectory, right? It's going to happen how it happens, and there's nothing you can really do to kind of dictate it. There's factors you can do to make it worse or make it better, but there's no way you can know how a conflict is going to evolve. No theory can do that. It's just kind of how it happens. And so what this meme is kind of showing is that like, as you have like this real world escalation and you break through the deterrence theory, a hundred like millions of people <laughs> are like the one who's are going to suffer, right? The innocent people who don't really get the privilege to think about nuclear weapons, don't have the ability to theorize and like think in like these nice abstract conceptions about nuclear weapons. They're the ones who are going to receive the short end of the stick or like quite literally the nuclear weapon. Um, so some other additional critiques, um, as like this um, has progressed and this theory has progressed, um, there have been like additional theoretical critiques, so kind of theories and theorists proposing new ideas and new ways of thinking about how we speak about nuclear weapons, how we conceptualize nuclear weapons. Um, my particular favorite is Carol Cohn. She released um, a publication called Sex and Death in um, the 80s, and so what she's doing here is she kind of takes both a linguistic and a feminist lens to the theory to show it's like inval it's invalid rather. So what she does is she calls deterrence theory techno-strategic abstraction, which is just a fancy way of saying 
how we like abstracting something to so like so many levels that it doesn't make any sense. It's not how we are actually thinking about these things. It's not how these things actually exist in the world. And so she's saying that by using this language, and it is inherently dangerous because it makes the weapons, the policies, the strategies themselves inaccessible to the everyday person. So if you can't understand what's being talked about and you can't understand or you don't have access to the language in which these things are being spoken about, you can't ultimately change the policy. You can't understand it. You can't do anything about it. So you're just kind of the victim, right? Um, and so she kind of goes on and again, provides this linguistic thing, um, linguistic lens to it. <clears throat> So I, the point I really kind of wanted to hit home with you all is that the way in which we speak about nuclear weapons um, is incredibly important. And I think that there needs to be new voices and new ideas and new theories and the underlying assumptions that are kind of challenging nuclear weapons today and how we are kind of just accept them and we embrace them and we say, oh, that's something I can't talk about is inherently dangerous and inherently wrong. We need to be able to say, hey, this is something that directly affects me because it is an existential threat to everybody. You need to be able to say, hey, this affects me. I have the power, I have the capability to speak about this and to know what I'm talking about. Um, and so what does that look like in practice? Kind of, it means that you have to be able to get involved. You have to be able to access the language, access the theory, access that. It can't just be some like old straight white men in a war room theorizing about deterrence, right? It has to be actionable and you have to be able to access, access this, this concept. Um, so kind of just my wrapping up thoughts is that while nuclear weapons are a product of the Cold War, the ways in which we theorize about them, the ways in which we discuss them, the ways in which we implement nuclear strategy don't also have to be a product of the Cold War. Because um, apparently this kind of thought process and this kind of strategy continues to yield the existence of nuclear weapons. And I don't know if that's the, the safest way or the sa like most strategic end goal, right? To kind of continue to keep these nuclear weapons. Perhaps there's something else, but in order to kind of consider the else, we need to have new voices, again, new ideas, un challenge these underlying assumptions that have created the policies that we have today. So, thank you.